and you never have to think about it again. So that's what I'm always thinking. People in my seminars say, uh, can I buy books? Do you bring books to your seminars? Well, way back in the day before Amazon, I did. I offered books. Um, and I felt it was found it was a tremendous waste of time. You had to ship the books to the seminar. You had to unpack them and lay them out. You had to prepare the credit cards and everything else. And then people would come and, and you know what they would do? They wouldn't even buy the book. They would look at the book and they say, well, if ever I want this book, I can go to Amazon and I can get it 30% off. And uh, I just, so I don't have to buy it here. And, and it was such a waste of time and money. So I only, only offered books once and I never did it again uh, because, because we made almost nothing, probably lost money. And when you take in all the labor and people you had to hire to process it. Anyway, so keep just keep thinking in terms of simplicity, reducing steps. If a person wants to buy a Barrett Kohler book, you can buy a Barrett Kohler book. You can go to Amazon. Amazon will send it to you tomorrow at a reduced price. We can't even afford it to sell you books. <laughs> that is so true. Well, welcome everyone. We are live with Brian Tracy and Anna Leinberger, and we are so glad that you've chosen to invest part of your afternoon with us. As we get started today, we want to welcome you and invite you throughout today's event to talk in the chat. And when you do so, we request that you use the drop down menu to select all panelists and attendees so that everyone will be able to see your comments. So if you could take a quick moment and let us know where you're calling in from today, we would love to, to know that and to be able to welcome you. And if you're representing an organization, uh, please feel free to mention your organization as well. And we'll give a shout out. It looks like Brian is in North Carolina. I did not know that. Uh, welcome in Mesa, Arizona, in Austin, Texas, in Idaho, in uh, Toronto, Canada, in California, Indiana, Missouri, Pennsylvania, Texas, Illinois. Uh, looks like we have some Canadian listeners, a caller from India. Um, wow. And Jennifer, we're, we'll give a shout out to Central Carolina Community College. So thanks for saying hello in the chat. Uh, welcome to Nico Ita joining from Nigeria. I hope I said your name correctly. Uh, we do have a caller from Trinidad and Tobago um, and from St. Lucia in the Caribbean. A uh, different Brian Tracy is in uh, somewhere else. I'm not sure. Um, we might have two Brian Tracys on the call today. That's pretty amazing. Uh, hi to Jacqueline who represents uh, the Veterans Employment uh, representative. So uh, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. And we are looking forward to some great learning. Um, wow, more international callers, Romania, uh, Bucharest, Romania, and South Africa and Belgium. Um, so that's tremendous. And, you know, before we get too far today, we want to get a sense of who our audience is so that Brian and Anna can direct their comments. And so I have a poll that I'd like to ask you. Um, we would love to know who is in the room. So if you are a parent or a guardian who's interested in this book for your child, we'd like to know that. If you're a teacher or an educator who's interested in this book for your students, uh, we would love to know, do we have any high school or college students on today's event uh, interested in the book for yourself. So I'll give you a few moments and it's a pretty interesting mix of people so far. I'll be glad to share those results with you in just a moment. A few other side notes, we are recording today's event. So in the event that you would like to share this with a, a colleague or your child or uh, anyone in your life who could benefit from learning from Brian and Anna, we will have this recording available. And we're going to ask you to stay on for the entire hour because toward the end of the hour we'll give you a chance if you have questions for Brian Tracy to come over to this side of the webinar turn on your camera if you like turn on your audio and actually voice your questions today to Brian and to Anna all right so let's take a look at who's in the room it looks like more than half of you are parents who are interested in this book for your children uh, it looks like a third of our attendees today are educators or teachers and a very small percentage of high school and college students. Looks like 4% high school students and 7% college students. So thank you for investing this time with us today. I do have one more. Um, I guess I didn't share those results there. You can take a look at them with me. Um, I do have one more poll for you. Um, Today's event is based on uh, a 
an amazing book. Um, and the, the words Eat That Frog are in the title. This book is called Eat That Frog for Students. And so the second poll says, are you familiar with the concepts in Eat That Frog? So yes, I've read the book or maybe the, the original Eat That Frog book. Um, I've heard the phrase before, but could use a refresher or I'm not sure what the phrase Eat That Frog means. So we'll give you a few moments on that. Uh, while you're answering this poll, I want to take a moment to formally introduce our panelists today. Brian Tracy is the chairman and CEO of Brian Tracy International. And as a keynote speaker and seminar leader, he addresses more than 250,000 people each year and is one of America's leading authorities on the development of human potential and personal effectiveness. He's the author of 91 books and more than 300 audio and video learning programs. So hi, Brian. <laughs> Hi, how are you, Becky? Actually, it's, I'm, more, it's more than a thousand audio and video learning programs now. Uh, I have I'm, been producing them for more than 30 years, and they're audio programs, video programs, combinations, uh, all kinds of uh, Facebook messages, and so on. So it's well over a thousand different programs or messages of some kind. Amazing. Wow. Thanks, Brian. And I want to take a moment also to introduce your co-author, Anna Leinberger. She is an editor, writer, and former high school teacher. And she is passionate about launching books that make the world a better place and amplifying the voices of authors who are doing the work. She has worked with authors, including startup founders, award-winning peacemakers, and New York Times bestselling authors. So welcome, Anna. So let's take a look. It, uh, at least 42% of the people on the call are not sure what the phrase eat that frog means. 44% uh, say they've heard it before but could use a refresher. So only a small percentage of our attendees today have read the book, 15%. And so let's take a moment. And Brian, I'm wondering if you can explain to us briefly um, the concept of Eat That Frog. But before I ask you to explain it, I do want to say that the original Eat That Frog book has sold over two and a half million copies worldwide and has been translated into 50, over 50 languages. So those are some impressive stats for the original book. So Brian, explain for us, give us yeah. a refresher. What does the, the expression Eat That Frog mean? Well, I uh, started off asking the question, why are some people more successful than others? And it was sort of like the, the theme that ran through my seminars and talks and workshops and so on. And I began to look at different subjects when I got into sales, why are some people more successful in sales? And I came up with the idea of what I call my 21s. And I developed a whole series of programs, 14 21s, which is 21 different ideas in management in in 14 different areas, for example, in hiring, uh, promoting, uh, motivation, uh, strategy, uh, marketing. And I, these four, and I wrote 14 uh, books and we published the 14 books worldwide. And it's the most amazing thing. I kept, kept having sort of uh, mental down dumps. And uh, with regard to time management, I came up with, a, with 21 great ways to uh, double your income and double your time off. And I sent this uh, book, which is about 100 pages, I sent it to Steve Persati, the uh, president, founder of uh, Nightingale, of, of, of uh, uh, Barry Kohler. And Steve came back and he said, well, it's an interesting book, uh, but I don't like the title. He said, could we change the title? And as it happened, one of the chapters, there's 21 chapters, not one of the chapters was Eat That Frog. And it was from a story by Mark Twain. And Mark Twain was a superstar uh, of his day. Uh, he was basically the biggest and best speaker, entertainer, uh, author, most amazing person. He took world tours and thousands of people came out to see him. Anyway, one of his one, little one-liners, he said that if the first thing you do in the morning is you eat a live frog, you'll have the satisfaction of knowing that that's probably the worst thing that's going to happen to you all day long. And then he was talking about doing the worst first or time management. So I took that and I expanded it out like an accordion and I added to it, if you have 
two frogs, if you have, if you have two frogs, do we eat the ugliest one first? In other words, if you have two important tasks to do, do the most important one, the ugliest one, the one that you are most likely to procrastinate on, and uh, then do the second one. And then it said, if you have to eat a frog um, at all, it's better to get on with it rather than sit and look at the frog for any period of time. So these are, this is where it came from. This is chapter, I think it was chapter 15. And uh, Steve uh, Persaudi said, that would be a perfect title for the book. If we could take that title and run it through the entire book of all these different ways of managing and organizing your time, then the book would, uh, would work. And at that time, there was a book like Fish. There was a book like Who Moved My Cheese? There were books that had little sort of animal themes to them. So if we used a frog, it would be an animal theme. We would piggyback onto uh, what was already popular and uh, we would sell uh, a few books. And so I rewrote the entire book with Eat That Frog as the theme. And it was, you know, set the table, get prepared, organize yourself, choose the ingredients and so on. And we released the book and the book took off. It literally exploded. Today, as uh, Becky said, it's in 51 languages. And uh, we have sold by our calculation more than two and a half million books, but it actually, it's actually more than 10 million because there are a lot of people out there who will take your book and publish it and sell it and not uh, report to you. Uh, for example, in Iran, it is illegal to pay royalties. And this book has gone into 14 printings in Iran. And I've been to Iran several times. And there are four publishers who've published the book. And they have actually told me they've sold millions of copies. And that's just one country that does not report their sales. So this has become probably the best-selling book on time management in the world. And I've had countless letters, hundreds, thousands of letters and emails saying, this book changed my life. This book made me rich. This book transformed my career. I've worked with company presidents who bought a thousand copies for everybody in their company. And then they had their human resources people design a seminars. So everybody in the companies all over the world has been through the Eat That Frog seminar. And uh, they say, is this okay? And I say, absolutely, yeah, go ahead with it because I can't stop them anyway. So you might as well make it a blessing. And so that's what people do is they take the book, they read the book, they, 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 they underline the book, they reread the book. It's the most amazing thing. It's a phenomenon worldwide. I've never heard of a book that's gone into more than 50 languages. And so that's where it all came from. And it's 21 great ways to stop procrastinating and get more things done faster. And the book is a life changer. The book contains the lessons on why some people are more successful than others. And if you learn these lessons and you internalize these lessons, they are basically foundation skills for the rest of your life. For the rest of your life, you're going to be highly productive, effective, you're going to get more things done, you're going to earn more money, you're going to be promoted faster, you're going to uh, move into the executive suite. You're going to have absolutely a wonderful life if you take these ideas and internalize them. And the sooner you do it, the better it will be for you. And so that's where it all comes from. And the reason that we're here today is because the book has been so successful and people have enjoyed it so much. And the version that we're working with now is the book for students. And Anna Leinberger has written the entire book for students, she has rewritten the whole thing and she's done an extraordinary job, far better than I could because she has worked with students and she has been a teacher of students. And so she has done this for students. And so it's a wonderful creation. And I thank uh, Anna every day for the wonderful job that she's done. She's basically taken my foundation skills and doubled or tripled their eff efficacy for students. She's made it possible for students to take these ideas, they're very simple, apply them, and literally transform their lives. Get, get A's, get into the best colleges and universities, get the best jobs when they leave school, get promoted faster. It's just a wonderful thing. So we really have to thank Anna 
because she's the person who's really made this book successful. Well, thank you so much, Brian. And Anna, I, I bet you're feeling kind of proud right now. That is so amazing. Um, we want to make sure that we talk a little bit more about why the skills in this book are so valuable to students. Would you be willing to share that with us? Yeah, for sure. Um, so uh, thank you, Brian. That was that was very uh, kind. And um, I had such a wonderful time working on this book. I think uh, all the teachers on the call will certainly relate to the the feeling of, of wanting to help students with this particular skill. And one thing that I found in my own classrooms was that there was just not quite ever enough time to teach the content that I had to be teaching. I had to hit all of my you know benchmarks, my learning goals, uh, especially when teaching AP courses. Um, I'm sure IB is the same, although I haven't taught in that particular system. But uh, you know you you want to be teaching your students all these skills as well on top of all the content that you're responsible for teaching. Uh, and when we were looking at the success of the original Eat That Frog, um, we saw a lot of reviews explicitly from parents or teachers saying like, I'd really like to get my students, I'd really like to get my kid to read this book. But when you read the original Eat That Frog, it's uh, not only is it structurally uh, geared towards somebody who has an unstructured eight hour work day. Uh, all of the examples are also workplace related. You know, you've heard Brian mention a couple of them, you know, get promoted faster, make more money, get more time off. These are not yet incentives for students. They can't work harder and get more time off, for example. Um, they can't necessarily get a promotion um, if, in, unless they're thinking about like a, a job they have outside of um, outside of their schoolwork. And so we had to really reimagine the frog, as it were, um, because a student is in homeroom first thing in the morning or in some other, you know, early beginning of the morning meeting or maybe even just in their first class first thing in the morning. And so you can't really eat your frog first thing in the morning, which is what the original book uh, recommends. So we had to think through, you know, like what does a student's life really look like? A student goes to homeroom in the morning. Uh, they have classes during the day, their time is structured for them to some degree, but in high school, and this is really where we started uh, in the book, in high school, then in college or in grad school, the further you go through education, the less structure school actually gives you. And as you grow up, you know, when you're a small child, your parents have to make a lot of decisions for you for obvious reasons. But you know, middle school, high school, college, these are the major transition years when you have to start learning how to do that yourself. And so as Brian mentioned, um, these are skills that will carry you through the rest of your life if you learn them early. And so it really is kind of the best time to be learning time management and learning it in this structured way, all these tactics. And we actually have 22 ways in Eat That Frog for Students because the, the um, methodology evolved a little bit. But in terms of eating your frog, you have to sort of rearrange how you think about eating the frog because when you sit down to study, that's when you enter this unstructured time as a student where you have to make your own decisions, manage your own time. And so, you know, what we advocate in Eat That Frog for Students is that you eat your frog as soon as you sit down. So if you sit down in a study hall, you want to eat your frog first. Um, you also want to make it an achievable frog. So if you have a 45 minute study hall, or if you're doing your homework in the evening, maybe you have two to three hours or four hours. Uh, then you also have different types of studying on the weekends. And so you want to make sure that in the beginning of the day on the weekend, you can eat your frog first thing in the morning. But on a Wednesday night, you may have to wait until you sit down to do your homework in the evening to eat your frog. So um, that's really one of the, uh, the major sort of flips that we had to do to do eat that frog for students rather than eat that frog for somebody in an office. Um, but honestly, one of the most empowering messages uh, in the book, just even to write for me thinking back to my own years as a student and to my years as a teacher before I got into the, the, book, the book world uh, was that, you know, Thanks to the internet, students have an unprecedented ability to take control and take ownership of their own education. Um, there are unbelievable numbers of learning resources out there on the internet, and we've called out quite a few of them in the book. We've directed students to explicit 
resources. I mean, obviously Khan Academy is the most famous well-known one, but there are so, so many others, uh, not just for content, but even other resources that teach you how your brain works. So the most exciting part for me in writing this book was researching all of the most recent uh, discoveries in educational psychology and like how your brain learns, actual neuroscience. Uh, and that's, of course, as Brian alluded to, informed his own research his entire life, um, psychology and, and neuroscience and all that. Um, so it was really exciting to apply things like um, just uh, one, one example is the fact that when you learn something, it goes into your mind and then you know, you don't think about it after you've actually read the book or been to the lecture and it sort of goes down on this curve, right? And you don't remember it, you don't remember it. And now if you let it go too far, you're actually gonna forget it. But if you let that curve of forgetfulness go for a little bit and then you catch it and then you put it back into your mind, you can actually increase the effectiveness of, of your memory. And so stuff like that is, uh, is all throughout the book. That's a really interesting concept, Anna. Um, and I know that another concept that's important to this book is the idea of self-esteem and how self-esteem might relate to time management and productivity. And that's maybe a connection parents on the call haven't made before. So I'm wondering, Brian, if you could talk to us a little bit about why you think those ideas of self-esteem and mindset are linked to productivity and time management. Well, uh, I uh, have now spoken personally to more than 5 million people around the world. And about 30, maybe 40 years ago, actually it was October 4th, um, 1981, I gave my first seminar on this subject. And I had an epiphany uh, the year before. And the epiphany was that your level, your self-esteem is the most important factor in your life, in your success, in your happiness, in your fulfillment. And I had never heard that before. And as I began to study it, what I found was your self-esteem is best defined as how much you like yourself, how much you respect yourself, how much you value yourself and appreciate yourself, and that everything counts. This is very important. Everything that you do raises or lowers your self-esteem. If you're washing dishes, the way that you wash the dishes raises or lowers your self-esteem. If you do it well, you like yourself more. You respect yourself more. If you do it poorly, you like yourself less and you respect yourself less. And so this whole idea of self-esteem is so profound is when you start and complete any task, your self-esteem goes up. I speak to large audiences. My average audience size is about 1,600 people with gusts up to multiple thousands. And I've spoken, uh, spoken all over the world. I've actually spoken in 84 countries and I've traveled in 126 countries. And so my average audience is, 100, is, is, is about 1,600. And uh, what I find is I, I'll ask the question. Uh, I said, if a person runs in a race, and comes in first, what do they call him or her? And everybody says uh, the winner, he's the winner or she's the winner. I said, that's great, that's true. Now, what happens if they uh, win in front of a crowd? Well, there's applause and everybody cheers. How does the uh, person feel if they uh, win, if they come in first? They feel fabulous, they feel like a winner. Well, the point is that every time you start and complete a task, to a small degree, you feel like a winner. You feel good about yourself. You feel valuable and you feel important. And not only that, you feel motivated to do it again because you like the feeling. When you start and complete a task, your, your brain, because remember, you, 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 nature has designed you to do things that are in your best interest for survival and growth. So when you start and complete a task, you feel like a winner and your brain, brain releases endorphins. Now endorphins uh, are called nature's happy drug. And when you start and complete a task, you have this rush of endorphins that makes you feel happy. It makes you feel good about yourself and it makes you want to repeat the process. And when you repeat the process, you get the same rush of endorphins and you want to do it again. So if you look at successful people, 
Successful people are people who are continually starting and completing their tasks. However, if you have, let's say, 10 tasks to complete, 10 homework assignments, 10 anything, is they can all be organized by importance. Is there's always one that's more important than number two, which is more important than number three, four, five, and so on. So therefore, the task that you choose to start and complete has a great impact on the amount of endorphins, how happy you feel at the end. And the worst of all is when you start, when you, when you plan your workday and you procrastinate and you only work on little or unimportant tasks or you don't work on them at all or you don't complete them. And what happens is nothing. And so therefore our whole theme that we've worked on is that if you want to feel like a winner, if you want to feel happy, if you want to feel powerful, but here's the other thing, in the world of work, you will find, and in school as well, is when you start and complete a task and develop a reputation for starting and completing tasks, other people respect you more and they like you more and they want to be like you and they compliment you and they move you to the front of the class, as we say. And it's, it's the most amazing thing. This whole idea of, of eating your frog basically gives you everything you need to become a really excellent person, not just in the eyes of other people, but in the eyes of yourself. You just feel happy most of the time. It's almost like you control your own happiness. You control your own success. I, and I, I am probably the, one of the top time management teachers in the world. And one of the things that I ask, I said, I say, what is the key to success? And of course, there's many keys. But one of them is this, is task completion. Is you don't get paid, you don't get promoted, you don't become successful by working on a task. You get um, promoted by completing the task. So everything you do in life from this moment forward is task completion. To start and complete the task. And I teach, I teach audiences uh, with people with 25, 30 years experiences who are uh, heads of major corporations. The same principle is your job is to work on task completion. So when do you start and complete your task? And the answer is first thing. The first thing you do is you start and complete a task. And if you start and complete a task first thing in the morning, if you eat a live frog, then what that happens is it motivates you to do it again and do it again. And wonderfully enough is you're continually stimulated and motivated because it makes you happy to start and complete tasks. So it's a really wonderful upward spiral that you, once you get onto, and one last thing before I give it back to uh, Becky and Anna is uh, Aristotle. And I studied uh, Aristotle when I didn't graduate from high school and I sort of wanted to impress people by my uh, erudition, if you like. And so I studied the philosophers and I settled on Aristotle, who I love. And Aristotle said that, that um, all of life is really habits, is that your job in life is to form good habits and make them your masters. And so the best habit of all is the habit of starting and completing tasks. It is the habit that leads to happiness, success, growth, entry to the best colleges and universities, feeling great about yourself. <clears throat> One of the examples that I use, I say, imagine at the end of the day, you have dinner and then you take all the dishes to the uh, sink and you wash all the dishes and you put everything away. And then you stand back and you look at the kitchen and the kitchen's all cleaned up. How do you feel? You feel great about yourself. You feel happy. You've completely started and completed an important task. And that's the whole idea of starting and completing tasks, homework, written tasks, assignments. The whole idea of doing that eventually enables you to develop the habit of task completion. And when you have the habit, so you're automatically working on task completion, as Goethe, the German philosopher said, everything is hard before it's easy. So starting and completing tasks is hard at the beginning, but then it becomes automatic and easy. 
And soon you get into the rhythm where you actually look forward to starting and completing your most important task. And your whole life, I say, opens up like a summer sunshine. And that's why this book has sold millions of copies. And how many, so many people have been profoundly affected by it because it's like taking uh, a, a food of some kind that, that, you may, that tastes great, it makes you feel good, it raises your self-esteem and your self-concept, it makes you feel like a valuable and important person. So that's what, and, and what Anna has done, is Anna has taken this and these principles, which she's very familiar with, and then she has restructured them for students, and, and even, even the parents of students, so that instead of worrying about creating or finishing an assignment at work, she's designed it so that students can take and complete assignments at school and develop early in life a foundation of the habit of task completion. And that literally guarantees their success in life. But not only that, it guarantees their happiness. If you're a parent or a student or, or a teacher, you want, your, you, you want your children, your students to be happy. Well, this guarantees they'll be happy. You're sort of in, injecting them with a happy drug by helping them to start and complete tasks. So that's what uh, excites us about this program. And that's why uh, we work so hard on it. And again, I have to give Anna uh, so much credit because of her uh, special experience working with students. And uh, everybody should read this book. It should just be a foundation principle uh, of life. And so I'll turn it back to you, Becky. Thanks so much. Um, so Anna, you mentioned that there are 22 concepts in this book and it's organized in four buckets. So I'd love for those on the call who haven't gotten the book yet for you to give us an overview of those four sections that the book is in. And then we also decided that we wanted to um, identify a few time management tips that you could share today so that uh, parents can recommend them to their students or students can implement them immediately. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so before I, I go in through the four buckets, I just want to take advantage of the fact that Brian set this up really perfectly. Um, I mentioned earlier that, you know, to change this, we had to take into consideration a student's schedule. Um, but task completion is pretty much the, the linchpin in terms of using Eat That Frog methodology as a student, because what you need to do, and this is, I can't remember what chapter it's called, um, study strategically in long and short chunks of time. Um, when you choose your frog, whatever it happens to be, for whatever time period you have, whether that be a 45-minute study hall, an hour-long study hall, or, you know, homework for a couple hours, or a weekend where you have the entire day, um, you want to make sure that you choose a frog that will, that you can complete in that specific chunk of time. So you probably don't want to start working on your massive history research paper that's worth 20% of your grade if you're only in a 45 minute study hall. A uh, 45 minute study hall is a better time to look through your flashcards for a language class because you can do that, you can get through a whole round of them. Uh, you can do a problem set for a math class depending on how complex and how long the problem set is, but you know, you could easily complete something like that in, you know, a, a, a two hour homework assignment or a two hour homework, uh, sorry, homework time frame when you're after school um, at the end of the day. Uh, so that would be one sort of very concrete tip that I would that I would put forward for uh, everyone here today. Um, but the four buckets, uh, we when we started this project, you know, as you know, Brian obviously has not been closely in tune with the uh, this, the world of students for a while um, since he uh, he does have several children but they're all grown um, and I you know my teaching experience was largely around you know 2008 to 2013 or so um, and so technology has advanced what it means to be a student has advanced the the, uh, the expectations of students they only keep getting uh, more intense and uh, more rigorous. And so we, we did a lot of research into um, what, what are the biggest challenges that students have today? Uh, technology obviously is a huge one where technology has just changed so drastically. Uh, many students are on computers, on laptops, have 
uh, digital time management trackers, et cetera. So we address all of that in the book. There's two chapters at the end specifically on technology. And of course that's also woven in through the rest of the book. Uh, although it was very important to us to make sure that this book is accessible no matter what level of technology you have. Um, because obviously Brian's audience is very international. There are many places in the world that don't have, you know, the continuous access to technology. Many people reading this book may be in the kind of society where everyone has an iPhone and iWatch and you get, you know, a, a laptop at the beginning of the school year, but that's just not the reality for so many students. Even in the United States, there are many under-resourced schools where students are still basically using the laptop version of a computer lab. Uh, and so whether or not you have a computer, everything in this book is, is very useful. Um, so the four areas that we kind of identified as being of particular import to students are obviously learning to structure your own time. Uh, so that underpins the entire book. And even in all of the other buckets, all of the tools in each bucket have to do with structuring time. Um, but this first bucket is more explicit stuff like the one I just mentioned, learning how to uh, identify which task goes in which time bracket. Um, so that's the first bucket. Uh, the second is studying something you are not interested and still doing well. Uh, and this one, when I found it, it, it made me smile because that, despite the fact that the time has, time has changed and technology has changed, that I think is uh, a struggle of students in memorial. For example, I myself did manage to get out of high school without ever taking biology. <laughs> I figured out mm -hmm. how to, you know, be, uh, do my little requirements and check all of my boxes. And I managed to only take two and a half years of science rather than the three that were recommended because I was so much more interested in history and languages and English and all of that. Um, so this is something that students obviously are still struggling with. I mean, the, the requirements to get amazing jobs, to get into the top colleges, to get into colleges at all, uh, really require well-roundedness. And besides that, you know, there's, there are requirements. You know, you, you have to take science, you have to take math, you have to take history. If you're a STEM student who's more interested in computer programming, that's not gonna get you out of the requirement to take, you know, African history or something like that. So motivating yourself to be able to do a, a, a class or an assignment in a topic that you're not intrinsically interested in is very, very important because you can't just show up to, you know, your college admissions with like a bunch of A's where you're interested and a bunch of C's where you're not. Um, and, you know, as you've probably all picked up from just the approach that Brian tends to take, he, there's a lot of psych psychology, a lot of psychological twi twist uh, tricks that you can use to sort of flip your mindset. Um, so that's bucket number two. Um, bucket number, buckets number three and four are related, but just slightly different. Uh, three is the pressure to achieve. Um, I just can't even imagine myself, the pressure that students are under. And when I was a student myself, things were stressful. You couldn't get into college if you just had good grades. You had to have good grades. You had to play an instrument or be on a sports team or all three of those things, you, you know, obviously. Um, doing volunteer work is, is critical to, you know, to be a good functioning member of society, but also um, because of college admissions, many students have to do jobs. I had a job when I was in high school, so you have to fit in time to do homework with the time that you're spending at your job. And so there's this massive, massive pressure on students today to, to overachieve. Um, obviously, great inflation has been happening for decades. And so anything less than a 4.0 starts to give students, you know, like massive amounts of stress. Uh, and so, you know, ultimately, all of this personal productivity is about doing things, doing things better. You know, as Brian's mentioned, um, the original Eat That Frog helps you earn more money and get promoted faster. You don't do that just by I don't know, showing up and smiling. <laughs> uh, you do that by becoming better at what you're doing. And so these techniques really do help students become better at their academics, at their um, uh, extracurriculars, et cetera. Uh, and then of course, proactively dealing with stress and what causes it is the fourth bucket. And so that's somewhat linked to achievement, but uh, there is a distinction between, you know, like improving 
how well you are doing and also just dealing with the feelings of stress uh, and the, the overwhelm that can come with being a student. So uh, those are the buckets. And I just quickly want to get to some of the practical stuff. Uh, this is actually from the first part of the book. So in the first part of the book, there are three chapters. Um, Brian mentioned uh, self-esteem, but there's also, we have a chapter on uh, goal setting and on personal responsibility. And so I'm going to share one tactic from the chapter on goals, because of course, setting goals sort of underpins a lot of the time management techniques. And um, as Brian will tell you, it is one of the most important skills for success that anybody can ever come up with. So goals, you know, I think everyone kind of knows in the back of their mind, like, oh yeah, goals are important. I should have them, etc. cetera. Uh, but Goals, again, alluding to psychology, there is a way to phrase goals that will make them much, much, much more effective. So a goal needs to be three things. They're called the three Ps, uh, present, positive, and personal. And so I'm going to explain what those three things mean. Uh, for a goal to be stated in the present, that is actually just going straight to grammar. It needs to be in the present tense. You don't want to think about a goal as if it's some future thing uh, that maybe you'll achieve or maybe not, because in your head, then your head doesn't fully believe in it, right? You have to state a goal as if you are in the present tense of having achieved it already. So instead of saying, I want to have an A in English class by the end of the year, you would say, I have an A in my English class. So that's present. Uh, positive, you always want a goal to be stated positively because you need a goal to tell you where you're going, not what you're trying to avoid. So instead of saying, I will stop procrastinating, you'd want to flip that and you'd say, I plan my days in advance and I complete my to-do list. So that's what it means for a goal to be positive. It's not necessarily positive like, yay, it's positive as in like generative, uh, as in like something that you want to actually achieve rather than something you want to avoid. And then finally, personal, this also goes to grammar. Uh, you don't want to start a goal with the phrase, my goal is to. Again, this, de this depersonalizes it. This makes it not necessarily in your brain. Your brain isn't forced to grapple with the fact that this is about you, about me, about the I. So that's why in all these examples that I've given, you say I. So you don't say my goal is to get better at geometry. You would say I can, so present, positive, I can write an accurate and complete geometry proof. So that's the personal. So that's my little spiel on goal setting, present, positive, and personal. Um, and I think- I love that. So I'll stop there, but there's way more of these concrete tips, 22 of them, in fact, uh, in the book. So, um, Anna, I did have a question in the chat a while ago um, from someone who was asking if the tips in the book work for neuro neurodiverse kids, so kids who may struggle with ADHD, ASD, ODD, et cetera. Absolutely. Um, in fact, I am also neuroatypical. Um, so the, the techniques and tools in this book are, they work particularly well for me. I can't speak for, you know, all neuroatypicals. And also I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Um, but the, the structures that the tools give you are particularly good for example, someone with ADD. Um, because when you have ADD, like your brain is just like a little ping pong ball and it's going all over the place. And the tools in the book tell you how to write your stuff down, how to identify priorities, how to write it down and give yourself a structure. And then all you have to do is follow the structure that you wrote down. So A, you own it. It's a structure that you created. It's not something that some teacher has given you when you don't feel any attachment to. Uh, and B, you create your own roadmap to follow. So yes, I would say absolutely. Thanks, I appreciate that, Anna. So if, if there are those of you on the call who would love the chance to talk directly to Brian and Anna and ask your questions, at this point in time, I'm gonna um, ask you to use the hand raise function, which would be in the bottom of your Zoom panel. And if you raise your hand, I'll be able to bring you over to this side of the webinar so that you can unmute your microphone and talk directly to, um, to Anna and Brian. But I did wanna make sure, Brian and Anna, in case you haven't been following the chat, a lot of people have been saying thank you so much for these resources. Sources, uh, people are coming up with um, ideas of how to use the book. Um, 
And so it's really exciting to see the feedback um, in the chat and we'll make sure you have a chance to read it all later. Um, we did also have someone saying thank you that you um, thought about the idea of accessibility in crafting the tips in the book. So that's really amazing to see. So um, if you'd like to speak directly to Anna or Brian, you can use the hand raise function and I'll bring you over or you can also feel free to um, type your questions in the chat and I'll make sure that we speak those out. Um, one of the questions that we had uh, previously identified that we wanted to talk about is the unexpected benefits of students implementing the ideas in the book. Anna, is that something you could speak to? Um, I would kick that to Brian, uh, just because I think Brian has, you know, so many decades of experience talking to people who've implemented books. Obviously, this book just came out a few months ago. And so I would say, Brian, what, what have you found that has been the most unexpected benefits that your students and readers have, have told you about over the years? Well, <clears throat> a very wise man who's no longer with us, um, at a meeting, he asked us a question about 20 very successful professional speakers. He said, what is the um, purpose of words? And um, everybody respected him. So that they realized it was not a dumb question, but it seemed like a pretty simple question. So everybody said, well, to communicate. The purpose of words is to communicate. And he said, yes. He said, but it's more than that. He said, every word is a condensed thought. And when you use a word, the more words you know, the more complex you can think. In other words, if you have a short vocabulary, the complexity of your ability to think is very small. If you have a large vocabulary, your ability to think and then to combine words with other words is greater and greater. And so we talked about that subject and I never forgot about it is that the more words you know, the more thoughts you can think, and the more complexity. When you understand these principles, it enables you to think at a higher and more complex level. It, it enables you to assemble uh, ideas and thoughts and to come up with uh, solutions uh, that enable you to accomplish vastly more. So these ideas that Anna is talking about and Becky is talking about, these ideas that we're talking about, the more of these ideas that you know and understand, the higher level is your thinking, the better and more complex thoughts you can think, the more uh, things you can accomplish, the better results that you can get, the, the, the more powerful you feel in your world because you have control of your world. So learning these skills and learning the skills foundation skills of Eat That Frog uh, enable you to be able to think and function and perform at a higher level than ever before and at a higher level than most other people. And that's one of the great advantages is you can look at your world and your world is not a scary world is you have complete control of your world because you know that if you want to be successful, if you want to be happy, if you want to be respected, if you want to get things done, you know exactly where to start and what to do and how to finish and so on. So there's a tremendous advantage to knowing these skills, these 22 skills. And that's why reading the book, many people read the book multiple times. Some people read the book uh, once a week for a year, once a, once a month for a year. And they internalize these principles. And as a result, they think completely differently about their world in a very positive and constructive way. And it is, has a multiplier effect, which enables them to get better and better results in every area uh, of importance uh, in their lives. So that would be my contribution. If you just learn a word, just the one word, and you understand this word and the complexity of the word. Let me give you an example, uh, a word like love, all right? Love is a very complicated word. If you look at the word love and what it means and how you practice it and how you uh, demonstrate it in your life and so on, wow. If you say freedom, if you say happiness, if you say success, each of these words is a multiple word. If you combine the words together with other words, 
you can create extraordinary thoughts. And if you can then learn how to combine these words with other thoughts and other ideas, you become a powerful force in your own life. So these, I'm getting a little bit abstract here, but it's very important because every time you learn uh, something new, an idea like this that gives you the ability to understand and to function better in your world, you feel happier and better about yourself. So that's why they did a study. They found that the people who have the greatest vocabularies are the highest paid, the fastest promoted, the most successful, uh, the, the, the most popular amongst other people. And uh, Harvard did a study where they just taught people five words a day for a year. So every year, five days a week, they just learn five, five every, every year, they just learn five new words. And at the end of the year, if these were people who were employed, they had been uh, promoted an average of two times. Their income has gone up 40 or 50%. They had gone from being an employee to having their own office and having their own staff, just learning new words. And the same thing applies to learning new concepts, like these concepts that we're talking about today. And so therefore, when you, as you learn these concepts, if you like, these, like them, you practice them. If you practice them, you start to expand your ability to accomplish tasks, to be successful, to be happy, to be productive, and, and so on. So that's one of the main reasons why you want to buy and read a book like this. And this is what people tell us. They buy the book and they casual about it and they glance at it and they maybe read the first chapter and it has this positive effect on them. They think, geez, that's a neat idea. I hadn't thought about that. I had talked on it. I think I'll read the second chapter. And they do. And as they read the book, they feel themselves becoming empowered. They feel themselves like they're stronger, smarter, more competent in their lives. And that's why people buy this book and read it and reread it and recommend it to others and buy it for members of their family and or share it. It's not, we're, this is not, a, a, our goal is not sell you books. Our goal is to tell you that there are certain things that you need to know, just vocabulary, for example, that can have a profound effect on the quality of your life and forever. Once you have this profound effect, it doesn't go away. It doesn't. It's not like you forget all the words and the concepts. You accumulate them and they build on each other. And uh, pretty soon your whole life is, uh, is wonderful. Your whole life is wonderful. So that's one of the great advantages because you feel empowered. When you know these concepts and you can apply these concepts to getting more things done, getting more things done are of importance. It helps you, it helps the people around you. Uh, this makes you feel wonderful. It makes you feel want, want to do it uh, over and over. And as Steve uh, Persati and I discussed, is that once you learn a new idea like this, it never goes away. Once you share an idea like this with someone else, they have it forever. So it's kind of neat. And it was a little bit accidental, but I had been studying. I studied now about 150,000 hours in the course of my lifetime, I read an average of three hours a day. And even as an adult, I still read three hours a day, sometimes more. When I travel and fly, especially overseas, I will study for eight hours uh, in a day. And, and I take notes, I underline and take notes and, and so on. And so what happens is you start to accumulate more and more of knowledge. But this is a foundation skill, eat that frog, is a series of foundation skills that once you have them, you have them for life. And the whole quality of your life will be different and better. Thank you, Brian. So um, we had a question in the chat regarding a Spanish edition, whether or not this book has been translated into Spanish. And thank you um, to Johanna from Barrett Kohler Publishers. Uh, they are the sponsor of today's event. And she filled me in in the chat that writes uh, to this book have been sold to a Spanish yeah. publisher and it's coming soon um, from a Spanish publisher whose name I'm not going to try to repeat, but it is the same publisher that uh, translated the original Eat That Frog book. Um, so exciting news for those of you looking for this book in Spanish. Uh, David has joined us as a panelist. David, do you have a question for Brian or Anna? 
I do. Thank you, Becky. And Brian and Anna, thank you very much. Um, I love the concept of Eat a Frog. Uh, it's something that I tell people to do all the time. I'm excited to recommend the book. And I love the fact that you've taken the concepts in the book for adults and translated it into uh, uh, verbiage uh, uh, for kids. And so here's my, it's a meta question for you, actually, right? So if the goal here is to get people to, and kids in particular, to eat the frog, to take the skills that are articulated in the book and make them habits, besides just reading, because what we know the content, we, uh, I've got many books that sit on my desk and I read them, but I don't actually put them into practice. So uh, in particular for parents, what sort of guidelines can you give uh, for structures to wrap around this beautiful content that you've provided so that those skills can become habits? Any suggestions for the parents here on the line uh, and educators to take that wonderful content and, and turn it into action? What is, what is your name again, please? My, my name is Dave Copans, um, and I actually have a, a software product for goal setting, so which is why all of this just resonates with me so, so much, Brian and Anna. Thank, thank you, Dave. You um, are obviously a, um, and I don't mean to uh, pour syrup on you, but you're obviously a superior person. You can, you can tell the quality of people by the quality of the ideas that uh, fascinate them, that hold them. So how can you, uh, the question again, please repeat it. So the question again is for parents in particular, how can we provide structure for them to help their kids take the content of the book and move it from content in the book into action, into habits that they've actually adopted? How do we get them to eat the frog? Well, Dave, the, the, answer, the answer is wonderful. It's when you, we praise and encourage your children when they practice these ideas is you, you work with them, you praise them, you say, that's really good, that's neat. You, you, you cause them to feel happy and you positively reinforce them. And as you reinforce them, they look for opportunities to do it more, to do it again, to get your praise and approbation, to get your, your reinforcement. And so therefore the easiest way of all is just to say, that's, that's a great job you've done. That's wonderful, that, hey, you re, that's terrific. I'm really glad you did that. And it's just making them feel happy about themselves so that they do it again. And then you reinforce it. And as you know, initially, when you want people to develop a thought, you uh, positively reinforce it every time they do it. And then you positively reinforce it every second time. And then maybe every third time until it's locked in and they just do it automatically because they automatically feel happy when they engage in a behavior that they know is going to earn them the praise and approbation of somebody who they respect. Uh, Somerset Maugham, the, uh, the great author, is one of the top authors in England for many years. And he was asked, why do you write? Because he wrote a lot of books. I've read many of, of his books. He said, why do you write? And these are the magic words. He said, I write to earn the respect of the people who I respect. And oh my, I just about fell off my chair when I heard that. I write to earn the respect of the people who I respect. And then I thought, wow, that's why we do everything. That's why you do what you do. And that's why what I and, and, and Becky and, and Anna, that's why we do what we do is to earn the respect and esteem of the people who we respect and esteem. Brian, Brian, um, I like it, it, I, um, Brian yes. I'll take the syrup that you poured and I gotta say your answer uh, just warmed my heart because the name of my company is Positive Feedback Loop, PF Loop for short. Wow. So uh, it's, it's all from my perspective, I nail it. It's all about finding specific, meaningful, positive feedback to the people in your lives to express that gratitude because that's the biggest dopamine hit you can give to them and everyone else. Um, so, wow, thank you for both of those things. And Anne, I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Yeah, I just wanted to also bring out a little thread that Brian said earlier. Um, and this is actually really just uh, a good, uh, I don't know, coincidence, not really coincidence, but um, one thing that parents can do is actually do this stuff with the student. Um, 
either reading Eat That Frog for students or reading the original Eat That Frog because a lot of the actual techniques are similar in both books. Um, obviously not all of them, so you know it's not 100%, but uh, I think it can be really powerful if a parent is actually implementing the same methodology in say their work. So again, it's really important not to, I think, patronize or talk down. In fact, you'll notice that this book differs from a lot of 14s books out on the market. There's no cartoons. There's no like silly things like, oh, we're going to get students' attention by making it silly and cartoonish. Uh, we take the students, you know, very seriously. Uh, and so if a parent actually implements the same methodology, but for something real that they're doing in their life, not just sort of like trying to patronize or talk down to the student, uh, that can be not just powerful modeling, but actual positive um, I don't know, like it'll, it'll form a connection that I think is really powerful. And Brian sort of mentioned that uh, in passing, just like doing something with your student, with your child, I think can be equally as powerful. Love that one. So okay. thanks to all of you. And we have uh, gone past the two o'clock hour. And so unfortunately we're out of time on this amazing event with Anna and Brian. Thank you so much to all of you who have invested some time this afternoon with us. We have a few calls to action for you that Kelly put into the chat. One is to go buy this book uh, today, buy it for your child, for your student, for, um, for educators who you might uh, admire. Um, this is an excellent resource and we encourage you to please uh, buy the book today. Um, we also do have the opportunity for you to win a copy of this book in a giveaway. We have a few copies and Kelly has put the link for that giveaway into the chat. Um, we will be uh, sending out a follow-up email that will include some additional resources for your learning, including the recording to this video if you'd like to share it with others. And finally, if you've read the book already or if you will soon read the book, we would please encourage you to leave an Amazon review, even just a few sentences of an honest review can help it, other readers discover this book. Um, and we would love to see this book expanded to millions of students in the same way that the original book was read by millions of adults. Uh, so thank you again for joining us and we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. It's a pleasure.